Good morning, Life Church. Glad that you're with us this morning. Um, if we don't know one another, my name is James Sharp. I'm one of the elders on staff here, and I do get to open Mark chapter 5 with you today. So if you have a Bible with you, I hope you do. I'd love it if you'd find Mark 5. We're going to be in verses 21 to 43. This is our 11th week walking through the Gospel of Mark. It's going to take us almost 40 weeks, I think, Lord willing, um, to get all the way through this book. Um, but we are today looking at um, what is a really like famous story from the life of Jesus and from the Gospel of Mark. I think it'll be, you'll be helped if you can have it in front of you while we walk through it together today. At the end of Mark chapter 4, Jesus, he rebukes the wind and the waves upon the Sea of Galilee, and immediately he calms a life-threatening storm. And since that moment, there's been this, this question that has just been lingering. But since that moment, this question has been kind of hovering over the developments in the life of Jesus and the lives of his disciples and his interactions with people. See, before Jesus rebuked the wind and the waves on the Sea of Galilee, before he saved his disciples' lives from the storm, they were afraid because they thought they were going to die in the storm. But then when Jesus spoke and he calmed the wind and calmed the sea immediately, revealing his supernatural power, the disciples were even more afraid. They realized that Jesus is one to be feared. And so they asked in Mark 4, 41, who then is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. Who then is this, that even the wind and the sea obey him? In church, we simply cannot overstate how critical that question is. Now, real talk for a minute. We live, most of us, in and around Salisbury, North Carolina, which means that we are literally surrounded by people who have no issue with the idea of Jesus. Right? People who are comfortable talking about Jesus, people who even will claim that they believe in Jesus. But the issue where we live is that many, many people are comfortable talking about Jesus and will claim that they believe in Jesus because they've never really reckoned with the disciples' question. Who then is this? that even the wind and the sea obey him. What I mean is that the idea of Jesus, that many people in our culture sort of inhabit, um, it's not really a biblical idea at all. It's a cultural idea of Jesus. Our cultural Jesus, right? He's one who never raises his voice. Our cultural Jesus is the Jesus who, you know, we picture him walking around with like a lamb in his arms, and he's talking about love and harmony and sharing. Our cultural Jesus, he's not someone who makes demands. He's not someone who makes commands. Instead, our cultural Jesus, really, he's just there when you need him. If you're in a bind, you can always turn to cultural Jesus. I think on a certain level, our cultural Jesus, he's really like a a cross between a genie in a bottle and Santa Claus, right? Like, make sure you're on his nice list and not on the naughty list. And by the way, the standards for being on the nice list among those who believe in cultural Jesus is incredibly low. Don't murder anybody. Make sure you don't steal candy from a baby, and you're probably going to be on the nice list in our culture. But get on that nice list. And then whenever you need to rub the genie in the the bottle, the genie is going to come out, right? Whenever you need Jesus, he's going to be there for you so long as you are on his nice list. This cultural Jesus, he'll never abandon you or forsake you no matter what, at least not if you have, quote, asked him into your heart, end quote. Our cultural Jesus, he just never lets you down. Now, the biblical Jesus, the Jesus who commands the wind and the sea and inspires fear even in his closest friends, well, I hope you know we're talking about somebody different altogether. The biblical Jesus holds all authority in heaven and on earth in his hand. And so, yes, he makes commands and demands. And by the way, if he has the power to command the sea and the waves and the wind, then he also has the power to command you 
and me. And his commands, they're not like the advice of a therapist. They're the edict of the high king of heaven himself. In the biblical Jesus will talk about love and harmony, but he also talks about sin and about judgment. And in fact, he says, what he says about love and harmony only makes sense of the, in the fact that, or in the context of the fact that we live in a broken world, a world that is in disharmony with its creator, and that we ourselves are sinners who live in glad, willful disharmony with our Father by nature. The biblical Jesus, he talks about love, but he also talks about the terrible and just judgment of God for our sin. And he came to give his life to make a way for us to be in harmony with our Father again in spite of that sin. And lastly, I'll say the biblical Jesus, he's not in your heart. Doesn't matter what you prayed with your parents when you were six years old, Right? If you are a Christian, your heart is sealed by the Holy Spirit of God, but this is critical. The biblical Jesus, he is not there because the biblical Jesus is still at this moment a human man who, though he was crucified on the cross to pay the just penalty of the sin of his people, he was buried in a grave, but three days later he rose again from that grave, literally, physically, and he lived on the earth for 40 days, and then he literally, physically ascended to the right hand of the throne of heaven. So Jesus is not in my heart or in yours. He is seated at the right hand of the Father on high, and by the way, he will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. The Bible tells us that when he does that, he will be robed in white with the robe that is dipped in the blood of his enemies, and he will come commanding an army of angels to put an end to all who rebel against him for eternity. That is not cultural Jesus. Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Like, do you see what I mean when I say that we can't overstate the significance of that question? When I say that there is literally no more significant question that can be asked or answered. Because if we've concluded that Jesus is something like cultural Jesus, well, in the end, that's not a Jesus that's worthy of our worship, of our allegiance. He's not worthy of our lives. And people live like that is the case. People who claim faith in Jesus, but then live like he's not really worth trusting or worshiping or following him. And so cultural Jesus is not worshiped or trusted or followed. I mean, frankly, why would you worship or trust or follow cultural Jesus? He's weak, he's soft. He's unimpressive and unimportant. You can see why a lot of people might believe that he exists, yet still to still prefer to live their lives without him. Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So at the end of Mark 4, we see that Jesus has power over the sea. In Mark 5, 1 through 20, we saw that Jesus has power over demons. Now, still answering that question, in Mark 5, 21 through 43, we see that Jesus has power over disease and even death itself. Now, our story this morning, it unfolds in three scenes. First, we're going to see Jesus with a man named Jairus. And Jesus with Jairus shows us that in his grace, Jesus responds to desperate faith. Second, we're going to see a scene with Jesus and a bleeding woman. And Jesus with the bleeding woman teaches us that in his grace, Jesus responds to deficient faith. And then third, and finally, we're going to see Jesus with a little girl. Jesus with this little girl teaches us that in his grace, Jesus responds even to defeated faith. But before we get to those three scenes, I need to say something about the way that this story is written, right? The way Mark has narrated this story for us and put it together in our Bibles today. Because the display of Jesus' power and grace in this story, 
they involve like two contrasting segments of society. On the one hand, this story revolves around an outcast woman, a woman who has been hemorrhaging blood for 12 years. Now, if you need an anatomy lesson in order to understand this woman's medical predicament more clearly, I'll be glad to tell you that Pastor Matt is available to make an appointment with you to explain these things. But the critical thing for us to understand here is not her medical malady, but how this medical malady would have destroyed her life. Because she was bleeding, because she was hemorrhaging blood for 12 years nonstop, this woman would have been a total outcast in her society in the time of Jesus. When bleeding, women in Israel were considered to be ceremonially unclean, according to Old Testament law. And so for the seven days or so that that blood normally flowed, they would reside away from and cut off from the people. And then only after the bleeding stopped, they would then go through a ritual cleansing, a ceremonial purification, so that they could return and live among the people of God again. But this woman, she's been bleeding nonstop for 12 years. And so she has been cast out of the people. She's never been able to return to live among the people of God. If before she began to bleed, she was married or had children, well, those relationships are over. Her husband has certainly left her. Her kids have certainly been adopted by someone else. And so she's alone. On top of that, she's poor. Mark will tell us in verse 25 that she spent all of her money on doctors, but that though the doctors have spent all of her money and treated her for many, many things, she's actually grown worse and not better. And so one commentator I read on this put it this way this week. He said, she had not simply been suffering from her disease, but also from the cures. And her doctors have exhausted her money which would have been one thing if they had cured her, but they haven't cured her. They've made her worse. And so this woman is just totally dejected. She's an outsider, an outcast. She's unclean. She cannot worship among the people of God. She cannot gather among the people of God. She's lonely. She's broke. She's miserable. But then this story also involves a man named Jairus. And he's called, in verse 22, one of the rulers of the synagogue. That means essentially that he's like the president of the board of elders in the church. He walks in and he has some gravitas, some credentials, maybe some swagger, and he's almost certainly a man of wealth and prestige. And so Mark, in this story, he's putting side by side two different people with two very real kinds of need. The woman, her need is obvious, but when Jairus, this wealthy man, comes to Jesus, he comes in need. His daughter, Luke's gospel tells us that she is his only daughter. She's sick. Let's see how this story unfolds as Jesus responds to the needs of both people. Here's the first scene, Jesus and Jairus. Here we see Jesus' grace as he responds to desperate faith. Mark 5, 21. And when he, Jesus, had crossed again in the boat to the other side, A great crowd gathered about him, and he was beside the sea. Then came one of the rulers of the synagogue, Jairus by name, and seeing him, he, Jairus, fell at his, Jesus' feet, and implored him earnestly, saying, my little daughter is at the point of death. Come and lay your hands on her, so that she may be made well and live. And he went with him. Now, over the last few chapters in Mark, Jesus has been going like back and forth across the Sea of Galilee, this side, that side, this side, that side. Now he's come back one more time to the side of the Sea of Galilee that he was on in the beginning of Mark chapter 4, if you remember the parables that Jesus taught there. It's possible that he's now back in the village of Capernaum, which operated sort of like his home base on this side of the Sea of Galilee. And as we've already seen in the Gospel of Mark, when he's on this side of the Sea of Galilee, like the crowds that gather around him are are very large, and and they're kind of unruly. They're, They're demanding. They're enthusiastic to see him now that he's back because they haven't been with Jesus since he calmed the storm or since he cast all of the demons into the herd of pigs. But surely they've heard about those things, right? And so they're eager to see if Jesus is going to do something spectacular again, and they're eager to hear what Jesus has to say. 
And so Jesus is here, and he has this large, unruly crowd around him. But then I imagine that a hush falls upon that large and unruly crowd when Jairus approaches. Because Jairus is an important man in small town Capernaum. But he also comes from the Jewish religious establishment. And those dudes already are very eager to be done with Jesus. They're already kind of riled up because of what Jesus has done and what Jesus has said. And so when Jairus approaches, I imagine that there are many people who are looking at Jairus wondering, what is he here for? What is he going to say? What is going to happen next? And then I imagine that the hush intensifies when Jairus falls at Jesus' feet and begs him to heal his daughter. <clears throat> She's at the point of death. And Jairus comes to him. Please, Jesus, please, come, heal her. I mean, this is a parent's worst nightmare, right? A most <clears throat> desperate moment in the life of a parent. It is emotional. <clears throat> I just have something in my throat. Excuse me. Imagine what would be going through your head if you were Jairus, as you sat at the bedside of your sick and dying daughter, you'd be thinking, I'd do anything I could to save her. You'd be thinking, I'd trade places with her if I could. You would be, well, desperate is the right word. Here's the good news for Jairus and for us. Many of us were not really ready to comprehend or trust the power of Jesus until we're desperate. Right? Many of us were not really ready to believe in something or someone more than cultural Jesus until we're desperate. But it's in those moments of quiet desperation that we can coming to Jesus realize that his power and his grace, they're what we really need. Right? It's when we're desperate that we realize that Jesus is who we really need. Jairus, in his desperation, he's turned to the one who has power to calm storms, to the one who has power to cast out demons, to the one that we're about to see has the power to raise the dead. But it's only in his desperation that Jairus comes to the point where he will seek out Jesus. Perhaps God has, or still will, use desperation in your life in the same way. You see, church, what many of us have learned over the years, and we always learn this the hard way, we can only learn this the hard way. But what many of us have learned over the years is that you can't really believe that Jesus is all you need until Jesus is all you have. You can't really rest in the power of Jesus until you realize how hopeless and powerless you are without Jesus. We can't really understand that Jesus is all we need until Jesus is all we have. In other words, like Jairus, we really need to believe that Jesus responds to desperate faith. And look, Jesus does graciously in Jairus' life and in ours. But look, look at the story. Look at how Jesus responds to Jairus. Verse 24, and he went with him. And so Jairus, he comes in desperation. Jesus responds in grace. Let's keep reading. It takes us to the second scene in the story, Jesus and the woman. And here we see Jesus respond in grace to deficient faith. Jesus, he's on his way to Jairus' home to save the day, but he gets interrupted. We're still in verse 24. And a great crowd followed him and thronged about him. And there was a woman who had had a discharge of blood for 12 years and who had suffered much under many physicians and had spent all that she had and was no better, but rather grew worse. She had heard the reports about Jesus and came up behind him in the crowd and touched his garment. For she said, if I touch even his garments, I will be made well. Now, let me point out 
two things right here. First, I want you just to marvel at this woman's boldness. We've already talked about the fact that she is ritually and ceremonially unclean according to Jewish law. She's an outcast, which means she's not supposed to be here. Right in this great crowd of people, as Jesus is traveling through the village of Capernaum, surrounded by all these people who are curious about what he's going to do, what he's going to say. Right, this woman is not supposed to be anywhere near these people because if an unclean person comes into close proximity with and touches a clean person, she makes that clean person unclean. And so that's why the Jewish law is so specific about this, right? She has to be away from the crowd, yet here she is in the crowd. And I would imagine that there's even a a measure of risk to her physical safety by embedding herself in this crowd because in some Jewish sects, like if you took the law of the Old Testament so casually, like the consequences for that were severe. And so this woman really, she risks her life. She could be stoned for coming and approaching this crowd of clean people and coming and approaching Jesus. So she's taken an incredible risk here. Why? Well, verse 27, she had heard reports about Jesus. In other words, she had hope. And that hope led her to do what maybe she hasn't done for 12 years. She enters this crowd, and she follows Jesus. I mean, imagine what, it would, what she probably looked like and, and smelled like, having not been around any person for 12 years. Imagine, like, the, the first time she's touched another human being in 12 years, and all she's able to do is she's able to just, like, grab at the hem of Jesus' robe. Think about the hope that drove her there, the boldness that drove her there, the daring that drove her there. But... This is the second thing. While what she does is brave and bold and daring, we need to note that the woman's faith is also deficient because she's not here to worship Jesus. She's just here to use Jesus for what he might be able to do for her. On top of that, she seems to have this like superstitious, almost magic-like thinking about how Jesus' power works. She thinks, I just need to touch the robe. The power must be in the robe or in his touch, right? Physical contact is all I need. And so she hopes to like sneak up behind him and steal that power. Now, I think this woman's misunderstanding reveals something that's really good for us. Like her superstition actually reveals even more of Jesus' grace. Because Jesus doesn't, at least immediately, correct her misunderstanding. Right? Jesus doesn't give her a doctrinal lesson and wait for her to sort her theology of healing out before he responds to her. No, Jesus heals her. Jesus has grace even for faith that is deficient, faith that is uninformed, faith that is misplaced. Maybe you have been waiting to take a step forward with Jesus because You think that you just need to get everything figured out before you do that. Maybe you've been waiting to take a step forward with Jesus because you don't yet have all of the answers. But friends, note that Jesus has grace for our misinformed, misunderstanding, and misdirected faith. He has grace when we come to him for the wrong reasons, and he has grace for when we come to him to use him rather than to worship him. This is how kind the real biblical Jesus is. He has grace for us, even when we, when we mistakenly treat him like the cultural Jesus. And that's true because it is never the quality of our faith that saves us. It is always the object of our faith that saves us. And so Jesus doesn't save us because we trust him the right way. He doesn't save us because the intensity of our faith is good or the sincerity of our faith is good. He doesn't save us because we don't doubt when we put our faith in him. No, he saves us because he's him, because he's a savior. And so he doesn't need to wait until our problems are sorted out or our emotional baggage is dealt with or our theology is right. He simply saves us when we come to him even if we come to him with weak and broken and messy and misunderstood faith. That's how kind biblical Jesus is.
Look at what happens next, verse 29. And immediately the flow of blood dried up, and she felt in her body that she was healed of her disease. And Jesus, perceiving in himself that power had gone out from him, immediately turned about in the crowd and said, Who touched my garments? And his disciples said to him, You see the crowd pressing around you, and yet you say, Who touched me? And I think you get their point, right? Like everybody's touching Jesus, right? Everybody's jostling and bumping into him. It's this large, unruly crowd. They're like, Jesus, what are you doing here? Everyone's touching you. Let's keep going. And think about Jairus for a minute, right? His daughter is dying. Every second is precious. Someone bumps into Jesus and then Jesus stops to investigate. Don't you think Jairus, at least in his heart, is saying, Jesus, come on. There's a lesson here. Sometimes Jesus compels us to wait. He compels us to wait because in the waiting, he withholds what we think we need in order to give us what we really need. What the story is about is about who Jairus is going to begin to understand Jesus to be. He's come to him. He thinks he's a teacher, maybe a healer, Jesus is showing Jairus that he has a different kind of power altogether. And so he waits. But then he also waits to reveal just how kind he is further to this woman. Look at verse 32. And he looked around to see who had done it. But the woman, knowing what had happened to her, came in fear and trembling and fell down before him and told the whole truth. And if you're reading Mark with us really closely, I hope you thought, it just happened again. Because this is now the third time in these stories that someone's afraid, and then Jesus does something incredible, and instead of rejoicing, that person responds in even greater fear. Right? This woman, I'm sure she was afraid when she came to Jesus. I'm sure she was afraid of the shame and the alienation that she's carried for these 12 years being found out. I imagine she's like covered herself as much as she can, hoping that no one will notice that she's there. And so she's fearful. But then Jesus heals her, undoing 12 years of misery. And guess what? She's even more afraid because she understands just how powerful Jesus is. And so she falls down before him. And then look at how tenderly Jesus deals with her. Verse 34, and he said to her, daughter. This is the only time in recorded history that Jesus addresses someone with a word so tender. It's the only time he calls someone daughter. Who does he save it for? This woman who has had no human contact for 12 years. This woman who has been an outcast for 12 years. She touches him. She's unclean. So now Jesus is ceremonially unclean, by the way. She touches him. He turns and looks, and he calls her daughter. He says, your faith has made you well. Go in peace and be healed of your disease. That brings us to the final scene. Jesus and the little girl. Here we see Jesus respond in grace to defeated faith. Verse 35, while he was still speaking, while he's calling this woman daughter, there came from the ruler's house some who said, your daughter is dead. Why trouble the teacher any further? I'm sure this is exactly what Jairus feared when Jesus stopped to talk to the woman in the first place. They're too late. While Jesus is speaking to the woman, calling her daughter, Jairus' daughter has died. It's Jairus' worst nightmare. And whatever hope that he had when he came to Jesus, hoping that he would save her, that hope is done. It's dead. It's defeated. But Jairus doesn't yet know who he's dealing with. Verse 36, overhearing what they said, Jesus said to the ruler of the synagogue, do not fear, only believe. We'll come back to that. Verse 37, and he allowed no one to follow him except Peter and James and John, the brother of James. They came to the house of the ruler of the synagogue and Jesus saw a commotion 
people weeping and wailing loudly. And when he had entered, he said to them, why are you making a commotion and weeping? The child was not dead, but sleeping. They laughed at him. But he put them all outside and took the child's father and mother and those who were with him and went in where the child was. Taking her by the hand, he said to her, Talitha kumi, which means, little girl, I say to you, arise. And immediately the girl got up and began walking, for she was 12 years of age. And they were immediately overcome with amazement. And he strictly charged them that no one should know this and told them to give her something to eat. Now, in verse 41, Mark records Jesus' command, Talitha kumi. He records that in Aramaic. So in the time of Jesus, uh, most people wrote in the language of Greek, a specific kind of Greek, Koine Greek. Greek was the language that people wrote things down in. But in and around where Jesus lived, the, the common language of the people, there's a fancy word for this, you can use it to impress your friends at lunch later, the lingua franca, that was Aramaic. So if you spoke, you spoke in Aramaic. If you wrote things down, you wrote things down in Greek, which is why the Gospel of Mark and all of the New Testament is written down in Greek, in Koine Greek, except for a couple of words that are in Aramaic that have made it into the New Testament. These are two of them. Talitha kumi. Why did Mark record this in Aramaic rather than in Greek when he immediately then had to translate it for us, right? You saw that. He says, Talitha kumi, which means, like he translates it, little girl, I say to you, arise. Well, scholars think that this moment was so powerful, so poignant, so memorable, that when the apostle Peter told Mark what had happened in that room inside that house of Jairus in Capernaum that day, that, that Mark, he was so struck by this memory that he wanted to write it down exactly as it happened. He wanted to record exactly what Jesus said, and so he wrote it down in Aramaic. It was such a pivotal moment that Mark wanted to record it exactly as it happened. Talitha kumi, little girl, arise. And she did. Now notice, one more thing. I said we'd come back to it. Verse 36, when Jairus hears that his daughter is dead, Jesus' response to him, do not fear, only believe. And fear, it's the theme that's like tying all of these stories together, right? Jesus calms the storm. The disciples were afraid before. Jesus calms the storm. They're even more afraid. Mark chapter 5, verses 1 through 20 Right, Jesus, he exercises these demons that are inside this man. Everyone is afraid of the man before. That's why they made him live far away. But after Jesus exercises the demons, they're even more afraid of the dude now because of Jesus and his power. Here we saw the bleeding woman. She was afraid to enter the crowd. Jesus heals her. She's even more afraid. Now, finally, Jairus, do not fear, only believe. What's going on? Well, we've seen Jesus' power of the storm, power over demons, power over disease. Now he's about to reveal his power over death. And Jesus' point is not that we should not fear anything. It's simply that there is a power that is greater than the power of death here. There is a person who holds life itself in his hands. So we should not fear death and disease in this world. We should fear him. How do we fear him? We believe. We trust him. This is what Mark's trying to teach us. Power over the storm, power over demons, power over disease, and now power over death itself? Who then is this? Jesus is God. That's what all of this is proving. I wonder if you've ever had the experience of being out in the world and like meeting in real life um, a famous person and being kind of unsure how you're supposed to respond to them or treat them. A few years ago, uh, we were visiting my sister-in-law, who lives in Nashville. Um, my sister-in-law, she lives in one of those like really old neighborhoods that like everyone wants to live in now. Um, and so it's that situation where like 10 years ago, the houses were like 150k, but now they're worth a million bucks because like it's just for whatever reason, like the gods have decided it's like one of those cool hip places, and everybody's trying to get real estate there. Um, and so we were visiting her, and I was out walking my dog with her. 
um, one day, and uh, we passed someone, and I, I saw him coming. Um, I was pretty sure, as I saw him coming, that he was like a, a, a sort of famous, recognizable, like recording artist, which would make sense in Nashville, of course. Um, but he was walking his dog, too, in the opposite direction, and he had a hat on and sunglasses, and so I wasn't like 100% sure that it was him. And so like, I looked over at Meg, my sister-in-law, and I'm like, hey, Meg, isn't that... And she just glared at me. She said, yes, don't say anything. And I was like, okay. So I shut up and we walked on. He passed us with his dog. I passed him with my dog. And we walked on for several hundred feet until he was out of sight and out of earshot. And then she turned to me and she said, this is Nashville. We don't do that here. We don't acknowledge celebrities here, is what she's saying, because we see them all the time. We don't acknowledge celebrities here because we see them all the time. It's kind of a fascinating idea to me, honestly. Like, we're so familiar with and comfortable with greatness that we no longer need to acknowledge it when we pass it on the street. We're so used to rubbing shoulders with superstars that we can't be bothered. Isn't that a picture of how so many of us respond to Jesus, at least cultural Jesus. Doesn't our attitude reveal that we're so desensitized to his power and his grace that we just aren't impressed by him anymore? Now, we'd never say that, of course. We'd never admit that we think that way. But the problem with cultural Jesus is that we don't think he's really worthy of acknowledgement. Or maybe we'll acknowledge him, but we won't make him the still point of our turning world. We won't make him the center that our entire lives revolve around. What I hope to lay before you this morning, church, is that with the true biblical Jesus, that's simply not an option. Right? He's so awesome and so powerful and so terrifying that you have to do something with him. Right, that's what we're seeing here in the story. When people meet him, even when he does good and miraculous things for them, they are simply stunned. Often people have no clue how they should respond, but they recognize that Jesus demands a response. Right? Even these people know that it's impossible to meet this kind of power, this kind of power manifest in a person and simply ignore it. Right? You can't come face to face with this Jesus and just pass him on the street. When you meet, truly meet, the biblical Jesus, that changes everything in your life from that point forward. Because either you embrace him and make him the still point in your turning world, or you reject him. But you don't do this, he's a part of my life, cultural Jesus nonsense. You just can't do that. Now, I read this quote a few months back, like early in the Mark series, but it's relevant again And there's some fire here, so I'm going to read it again. This is from a British historian and theologian. His name is N.T. Wright. And he's talking here about, essentially, about the difference between cultural Jesus and biblical Jesus and how, in truth, this cultural Jesus idea, it is impossible to sustain. He asks, how can you live with the terrifying thought that the hurricane has become human, that fire has become flesh, that life itself became life and walked in our midst. How can you live with that? He goes on, Christianity either means that or it means nothing. It is either the most devastating disclosure of the deepest reality of the world, or it is a sham, a nonsense, a bit of deceitful play acting. Most of us, unable to cope with saying either of those things. What are the two things? That it's a sham or that Jesus is everything, right? Either it's deceitful play acting or Jesus is the hurricane become human. Most of us, unable to cope with what it means to say either of those things, we condemn ourselves to live in the shallow world in between. Church, this is the reality that biblical Jesus forces upon us. He is the hurricane become human. He is the fire made flesh. And so, Either decide that it's not worth pretending that that's true, 
Decide that that's deceitful play acting. Or decide that he is the most devastating disclosure of the deepest reality of the world. There simply is nothing real in between those two poles. Just don't do this cultural Jesus nonsense. Don't condemn yourself to live in the shallow world in between. I mean, ask yourself, do you pray to Jesus when you're in trouble or in distress, but then just ignore him when life gets busy? Do you obey Jesus when it's convenient or expedient or when people are looking? But do you then succumb to the dark desires of your heart when you are alone and no one is looking? Do you compartmentalize your life? giving Jesus rule and reign over certain relationships but not others? Do you submit to Jesus certain pursuits but not others? Do you praise Jesus with your words but then treasure worldly things in your heart, things like your own comfort, the approval of others, achievement and success and notoriety? Who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? Who then is this that even death and disease and demons obey him? He is the high king of heaven, the hurricane made human. Bow before him and worship him with everything that you are and have. Pray with me. Jesus, we pray. We pray that we would be uh, intellectually honest enough to acknowledge that we have, we have condemned you to that shallow world in between. We pray that we would see and believe that who you are demands either complete rejection or complete allegiance. And may we not try to do something else. May we recognize that you are fire made flesh, hurricane made human. May we recognize that you have power over the sea, over demons, over disease, over death, and even life itself, because you are God. And then may we recognize that as God himself, you come to us with such grace and kindness that when we are desperate, you respond. When our faith is deficient, you respond. And even when our faith seems defeated, you are never defeated, so you respond. If we're present in the room this morning, God, and we're desperate, help us to bring that desperation to you. If we are gathered in the room this morning, God, and our faith is deficient, may your power and sufficiency be revealed in our deficiency. And if we're gathered in the room this morning, God, and we're on the verge of giving up, may we see and believe with true faith that you have power over life and death, the grave itself, you have power over all things. May we trust you and worship you. Pray that in Jesus' name. Amen.